Summer ended several days ago. The grasshoppers have ceased to sing, and the ants will soon be eating their corpses. Everything old is disappearing. is invading the whole of Iberia. It's not always on time, nor does it arrive everywhere at the same time. The seasonal conditions sometimes arrive early or late by perhaps a week or two. But the hours of daylight grow shorter, and the nights grow cooler. The first rains come, and the summer heat is long gone. It has begun to rain in the hills of Toledo. Soon the grass will grow, and that energizes the red deer. They've been thirsty. The golden color of the fields is a sign that it has rained little in this land during the summer. No doubt it was very nice on the seacoast and near other sources of water, but this country is tough. The dryness and the heat in the hilly Mediterranean inland are extreme. The deer in this part of the world aren't the biggest, nor do they have the biggest horns, nor do they have the most striking coats, but they're very tough. They're the only deer who can withstand the rigors of life here with no more help than their own genes. Autumn is their mating season, the rut. From north to south, the entire Iberian Peninsula resounds with their bellowing, day and night, but especially night. Their hormones and their need to mate turn the male deer against each other. All the bucks want the same thing, a harem and some territory. There aren't many more does than bucks, and each dominant male can claim up to 50 females for himself. So there are never enough does to go around. The strongest bucks take possession of all the does they can, while the rest of the males, the vast majority, simply won't reproduce. That's the most common rule in nature. The only things that vary are what each species looks for and how they do it. Cabañeros National Park is a red deer's paradise. Although the number of deer per square kilometer may already be too great, and the tension during the rut is very high. But they have no direct predators. Wolves haven't hunted around here for a long time. So the natural selection of the reproductive males is made above all by fighting. When they 
do battle, the greatest danger to the deer isn't getting gored, but dying of exhaustion. In this land of scarcity, burning heat and icy cold, endurance is the most important quality. These two large bucks know each other well. They've already fought on numerous occasions and have a big score to settle. They're deciding who should prevail. Each large male boasts a territory that ranges from two to eight acres. They defend these areas as their own personal territory because they're prime land where the grass grows the earliest with the first rains and the females gather around these territories. They essentially come to eat. Although they also come not so much because they're attracted to the dominant males, but in order to dodge the sexual attentions of the pesky young bucks so persistently pursuing them. When there's enough grass to eat, the females tend to drift apart. And then the alpha male has to round them up, chasing them constantly, desperately. Autumn is an exhausting time for the bucks. There are days in this season when it seems like the good weather is back. The ladybugs, the beetles with the seven polka dots, are also sexually active at this time of year, as if inspired by the red deer. But what triggers the reproductive behavior of these insects precisely now is just the right combination of temperature, light, and humidity. Some autumns reproduce the same weather conditions of certain spring seasons. And some life forms can't tell the difference. Or they try to squeeze out an extra generation. There's no question that if a climatological catastrophe wiped out the winter season, the genes of these insects would be the first to prosper. But under normal conditions, this autumn's generation would spend the whole winter in the form of an egg. And the new larvae would be born in spring, just as they should be. Doniana. It's in the southwestern corner of Europe, a wetland like no other anywhere else in the world. It's full of life. Marshes, 
pine forests, and sand. Although it's small and vulnerable. Doñana is almost African, just 10 miles as the crow flies separate it from the neighboring continent. Barely a hop, skip, and jump for many of the birds that pass through here on their annual migratory round trips. They all tend to lay over in this land that dries up or floods with water according to the season. Some flowers only open at this time of year, in October. This species sprouts from a bulb that can only be found in Iberia. It's popularly known in Spain as the quita meriendas, or snack suppressor, because it emerges when the days are growing shorter and there's less time between lunch and dinner. So it blooms when there's no longer time to have a mid-afternoon snack. There's always some insect ready to savor some nectar and in exchange, fertilize each season's flowers. But autumn's flowers are few. And that's why so much life gathers around them. What's more, they don't last long. Time is working against them and in favor of the cold. In Northern Europe, the weather conditions have once again forced the cranes to make their migratory journey. These birds are very tough, but they could never survive the winter so close to the polar circle. By mid-October, the first cranes are crossing the Pyrenees. They fly in formation, thus reducing the friction with the air, and in that way, they save up to 30% of their energy. Nevertheless, many won't reach their destination. Their flying speed varies from 40 to 80 kilometers per hour, depending on whether they can take advantage of the winds. As they try to find the most favorable winds, they sometimes fly close to the ground, barely 200 meters over the trees. And then it's impossible not to notice when they soar by because their flocks are very noisy. Sometimes, however, flocks of cranes fly at altitudes of more than four kilometers. But even then, you can hear them if you pay attention. below the cranes, the ants' activity is frenetic wherever you look. The gatherers are filling the last empty shelves in the pantry with whatever they can find. The ants are expanding their chambers or making preparations to handle the water that could soon pour into the ant nest.
Iberia is located on the perfect latitude to feel clearly the four seasons that take place here as the planet revolves around the sun. The 23 degree inclination of the Earth's axis now causes the rays of sunlight to strike the land at a steeper angle than in summertime. And that changes everything. continue to lower the temperatures. Plus, the altitude in the Guadarrama Mountains accentuates the cold. The drop in temperatures makes the reptiles and amphibians sleepy. Their movements become clumsier, and their ability to attack or to flee is quickly diminishing. It won't be long before it's time to hibernate, but they all must do their best to store as much energy as possible. The rain also has its effects underground. Buried alive, the young of the Spanish pond turtles see their opportunity. The increased humidity of the soil finally allows them to come above ground. They've stayed practically immobile in this narrow burrow since last summer, when they broke through their shells and hatched. Now they can emerge because the wet earth has become soft enough for them to dig their way out. If this autumn had been drier, the little turtles might have been forced to wait until next spring. But they were lucky. The first thing their eyes see is a cool autumn day. Their instincts orient all of them in the same direction. They immediately look for water, because on land they're easy prey for just about anybody. The Spanish pond turtle is a species indigenous to the Iberian Peninsula, although it can also be found on the other side of the Strait of Gibraltar in Africa. can take advantage of a few warm days to feed on aquatic larvae and carrion. Soon these waters will freeze over and they won't be able to stay active. They'll have to look for a river or lake bottom that's deep enough and muddy enough to survive the winter.
The rain will fill these shallow ponds and afford them a new opportunity. It's late October. The tarantula wolf spider now brings its young out into the world. She doesn't need to eat anymore. She's already done her duty. She's four years old and enormous for her species. She'll die soon, in just a few days. But as long as she can walk, she'll carry her 100 children on her abdomen so that her offspring can spread out over as large a territory as possible. The newborn spiders will leave their mother wherever happenstance or instinct tells them to. should also be covering the parched ground in the Doñana marshlands. But in the south of Spain, the rain almost always arrives late. And that ruins everybody's plans. The fallow deer have been restless for several weeks. They've been bellowing more than usual, and that demands a lot of effort. that they're in their reproductive period. The males have fought hard for the females, and many of them have been impregnated. But not all of them by the best males. As a consequence of the drought, there's not enough grass available, and that has forced the does to disperse. That has also stretched out the period of the rut and made it more difficult for the champion bucks to keep large and faithful harems under their protection. The fallow deer are the subject of in-depth studies in southern Spain. And researchers have recently discovered that not everything is as simple as we thought. The species' sexual behavior doesn't follow the human stereotypes as closely as we believed it did. Apparently, when faced with unusual weather conditions, the bucks with different body shapes can try a variety of strategies in the attempt to have descendants. And so it is that some quite small males with very unimpressive horns, which wouldn't dare to challenge the bigger males directly, are on the alert to take advantage of any lapse in security on the part of the owner of the harem. And their greater agility gives them an advantage if they have to run away. That's the way they can reproduce. The late flooding of these vast flats gives a lot of opportunists better chances. But the consequences of the lack of water now will be evident next spring. If the births of the fawns are also delayed, many may not have a chance to survive.
The common crane reproduces and raises its chicks in Scandinavia and northern Russia and spends the hottest months of the year there, from March to October. But now it's time to seek refuge from the low temperatures and lack of light. So they come south, flying up to 3,000 kilometers. They look for places where ice and snow don't hide all the food. Some fly to Turkey, many others to Italy and Greece. But most choose the Western European route. And so each year, more than 100,000 cranes arrive in Iberia. Gallocanta is their most important gathering point, the species' favorite spot. Many cranes just stop here to rest for a few days and regain their strength before continuing on their migratory journey to the open oak groves of Extremadura or even North Africa. But many others spend the whole winter here. The lakes of Gallocanta are surrounded by fields recently sown with grain. And their shallow, salty waters are the perfect haven to avoid foxes, wild boar, and wolves. Soon people here will be celebrating All Saints Day, the 1st of November. The season's first freeze will kill off the praying mantises that were born last spring. At the end of their lives, when death is near, is when this mantis can behave in the most extreme ways. Like eating the male during copulation, or fighting another female. Two females have coincided on the same prime spot from where they wanted to release their pheromones to call out to any male that might still survive. But more than a fight over territory, this is going to be a fight fueled by hunger. There's little food left in the ecosystem. The mantises may be the only insects that are still active. So the body of one of their peers may provide the last available proteins to lay one more batch of eggs. Yes, mantises can be cannibals.
In the north of the peninsula, in the foothills at the western end of the Pyrenees, the colorful forest leaves no doubt as to what's going on. Yellow, brown, ochre, and red, as well as the original green. One by one, the beech trees in the Irati forest have gradually shut off the flow of sap. One by one, their leaves die and change, and they fall. The trees fall dormant, but not dead, until the right conditions return to wake up again. After about six months, In this way, plants can live intermittently, but for a much longer time. Much longer. Some of these beaches are over 40 meters high and are hundreds of years old. This young seedling is still quite small, and just being stepped on could kill it. But it could grow to become like one of its brothers, and still be alive in the year 2300 or 2400, if we respect it. Many living beings will depend on the survival of the trees in these 50,000 acres of forest. This is one of the largest beech forests in all of Europe. And there are several others nearby that would like to form one giant forest. When the leaves fall, that allows more rays of light to reach the forest floor. And so the mushrooms get their opportunity before the temperatures drop enough to bring serious freezes. The organisms that make the most of this weather aren't animals nor plants, but rather beings that are somewhere in between and that need inorganic food as much as living matter. The entire forest is connected to the fungi. of 90% of plant species are entwined with the hyphae of fungi. Only thanks to this symbiosis can plants obtain the nutrients they need. And in exchange, they offer the mushrooms the water that they can't get on their own. The mushrooms are reproducing in autumn in the northern hemisphere. And that's why they're opening their umbrellas above ground. The only purpose of these organs is reproduction. They rise a little above the ground and the fallen leaves, looking for a little help from the air currents to spread their spores as far as possible. These millions of cells contain the genetic code of each individual mushroom. They're countless. 
for days, even whole weeks, innumerable spores will fly incessantly from each cap. with the aim of at least one of them growing into a new mushroom. Another fungus, a clone of its parent. Because there's no sex involved, only multiplication. Until the frost withers them. This is still a land of forests. In the Middle Ages, it was said that a squirrel could cross the Iberian Peninsula by jumping from branch to branch without ever touching the ground. Today, there are many fewer forests, and they're much smaller. But Spain is still the second country with the most woodlands in Europe. 18 billion trees. Nonetheless, even more impressive than the quantity of trees in this land is the biodiversity and quality. The straight trunks of the pines of Balsain are evidence of the race towards the light of each tree. The needles of this very Mediterranean species don't fall, at least not all at once, like those of the oak trees or beeches. That's why pine needles don't change color, at least until the ice and snow cover them for a time. Now the fog dampens all the colors. But that's only a visual veil that gives the forest a new beauty in shades of gray. The fog provides as much moisture as the rain and softens the temperatures. It will hold off the winter a little longer, increasing the density of the air and delaying the first freezes. Sometimes, even in mid-November, the air shakes off the chill and the sun doesn't hide the way it does behind clouds. The fog is lighter. The winter preparations of the red wood ant are very demanding, and they take advantage of every ray of sunlight. As they pile up tiny twigs over a period of years, a colony of red wood ants can build a mound up to a meter high. These constructions provide both protection and thermal control. Fundamentally, their sloped walls can shed water and withstand the weight and cold of the snow that builds up on the structure. On the slopes of Peñalara and in the foothills of the Cotos mountain range, where pine trees and oaks intermingle, it is the ideal place for these treasures of Spanish zoology to prosper, a treasure that is getting harder to find every day. There are lots of foxes around here, both in the forest and in open areas. Although few people see them, and even fewer appreciate them, the fox is a discreet 
and silent predator, an animal that is as beautiful as it is hated here. Chicken thief, lamb killer, implacable rabbit hunter. From farmers to hunters, everyone considers the fox their enemy. Nevertheless, the fox is a predator that selects its prey, genetically strengthening its victim species and keeping the number of rodents under control. But the fox also has to live with the owl that hunts him and with the wolf that limits his range. It's all a question of balance. The naked granite rocks of the La Pedrita Massifs on the southern slopes of the Guadarrama Mountains form an unusual, tough, and astonishing landscape. Above all, because despite its desolate appearance, a lot of life clings to these immense cliff walls. This is the world of the Spanish Ibex. A rough and tough animal, able to eat just about anything to walk just about anywhere, and to withstand all kinds of climates. It has climbed up here to get away from the wolves and any other predator. And almost no one can follow it up here. At this time of year, the males live together on the highest peaks. It's very difficult to find them. It's said that they eventually form a single flock with all of the males in the area. And in spite of that, very few have seen it. Not until well into December have the robins stopped singing, marking their territories. But even they will fall silent soon. And the berries have been eaten too, almost all of them. Very little of what's edible is left, and that's hard to find. The spider webs are vacant. Their owners have died, or have hidden beneath the rocks. And their offspring that were born in late summer have flown off, literally. They've left a trail of silk from each twig where they took off. from their threads, like tiny kites. They're swept away by the wind, migrating south whenever they can, trying to spread to new territories, even crossing the ocean.
The Gulf Stream brings mild temperatures to Portugal and northern Spain. And that's why, even though these beaches lie at a latitude close to that of New York, the Iberian climate is never as cold. This is the coast of the region of Galicia, very close to Asturias. It's the greenest part of this country of sunshine. It rains like in Ireland, and is in the land of their Celtic cousins, the days of calm seas alternate with tremendous windstorms. On the threshold of winter, another storm has been unleashed on the Bay of Biscay. Today is the 21st of December, winter. From now on, it's a time of stillness and silence. A time to sleep for many. Nonetheless, most animals aren't able to hibernate. Many species have had to adapt to this continental way of life to a world of extremes where food is scarce six months of the year. Nature is tough now. And that, despite this bleak time of year, being the courtship season for amphibians, for owls, and for the Spanish ibex.